Another early morning. If you can call it that. I haven't gone to sleep yet, so it still feels like late night. Noriko has me on a short lease. I think she knows it too. Apparently, she specified this as the place of Junpei's death. Don't know how she knew of it. This parking complex belongs to Junpei's apartment building. It extends two or three levels underground. Again, Noriko specified the exact location of the death. The human removal service seems to take user requests very seriously. How much further in? Shh. Keep your voice down. I'm just looking for a good vantage point that we can hide. Her words are severed by, by a violent gasp. Unable to speak another word, she simply points. My eyes obediently follow the direction of her slender finger. It's a girl! It's a girl, she's wearing a skirt. Oh. And has boobs. Disappointing. Missed the main event. Junpei Matsumoto is already dead. He's floating in a sea of his own lifeblood. Vicious stab wounds pra practically glow red alongside along his back. After examining his remains, I turn my attention to the less interesting figure standing motionless beside him. You. The masked stranger looks like the villain from a B-rated slasher film. He's covered. That's not a boy. Unless trying to be really convincing to take away from his identity. He's covered, real identity. He's covered from head to toe in dark clothing, a zipped up jacket with extra long sleeves, a hood, a skirt. The cut of the figure's clothes combined with his physique gives me the impression that he may in fact be female. Is this the herald we've been searching for? The bloody corpse at her feet would suggest that it is so. A mask. A mask? It's simple, white, probably porcelain. It's reminiscent of something, some fictional character, or maybe some film villain after all. The herald still hasn't moved. She's as still as a statue, gaze vacant, her eyes impossible to discern behind the mask. Are you the herald? For the first time, the figure moves. It's a startling, jerky motion, like a mannequin or a puppet being pulled by strings. Her head cocks to the side, and she seems to notice our presence for the first time. But an answer to Noriko's question is not forthcoming. I step up to the plate. You really immortal? The herald doesn't react to my voice like she reacted to Noriko's. She has returned to a stiff, doll-like state. Pretty easy to prove if someone or something is immortal, and I've always had a curious mind. I draw the knife from my pocket and launch it at the mannequin. The blade embeds itself in the thing's shoulder, and she doesn't so much as flinch as a trickle of blood pools around the shining steel. Oh, Mr. Hart. Hojiro, why did you do that? I shrug and take a step toward the Herald, before Noriko tugs at my coat and holds me back. She takes my place and puts herself between me and the Herald. Tell us who you are. We deserve to know that much. Something in Noriko's words, the sound of her voice, or the tone of her plea, causes the Herald to move once more in acknowledgement. But the motion this time is quick, fast, calculated. The Herald moves a sleeved hand to withdraw the knife from her shoulder, and she allows the blade to drop down to the concrete ground with a dull ting. Before the knife, hit knife hits the ground, the Herald turns her back to us and breaks into a sprint. Shit. Not cut out a chaser. Don't bother. We won't catch up. The Herald disappears into the darkness of the parking lot. We are left standing by the corpse of Junpei Matsumoto. Well, we didn't see the killing, but at least the request was granted. She's right, her gambit played off, paid off. The Herald killed her own ally. She is proving her convictions are strong. I crouch down to examine Junpei's corpse, but it's hard to get a good look in the darkness. Regardless, it's clear that the dog is dead. Should we leave the body? Mm, going to send a text. Huh? Who are you messaging? See if I can pull a few strings. Wouldn't mind if the corpse ended up at my morgue. What are you planning? Nothing. Really. Just want to prod and poke a bit. Noriko's subsequent grunt is a clear indication that she doesn't fully believe me. <sighs> Do what you want. I've gained as much from this as I had hoped. I let her trail off as I turn my attention to my phone. I swipe through my contracts and quickly compose a message to a few people in particular. If all goes well, an investigation team will shortly arrive to examine this scene. I'll be gone by then, but if my contacts do their jobs correctly, they'll hold Junpei back to the morgue. I pocket my phone and scurry toward the blood-soaked knife I launched at the Herald. It slides back into my pocket and I signal to Noriko that we should depart. Goodbye, Junpei Matsumoto. She waves half-heartedly at the corpse and lets out a childlike giggle. Okay, so nobody cared that all those corpses went missing from the morgue then? Like, no one's parents or family are going to, like, complain that their corpse of their family member or friend or whatever went missing? A scant few hours sleep didn't offer much in the way of refreshment. Have to be at the morgue again in an hour. Not that there's much to do there since the place was robbed. Perhaps a few more cadavers will have arrived. Perhaps Junpei Matsumoto's corpse will be there. 
I should take this opportunity to take a breath. It's been a while since life slowed down like this. No requests coming through for Corpse Girl. No bodies to haul around town with Tomoe. No cadavers to catalogue at the morgue. Life should be good. I'm still alone, and Noriko may decide to discard me at any moment. Why does that make me want her more? Do I want to prove my worth, my value? Prove to her that I'm worth keeping around? Don't know. Doesn't matter in the long run. After brewing myself a cup of coffee using the French press Tomoe gifted me, I take a seat in my chair. Sitting alone in the darkness is somewhat depressing, but it's only temporary. I won't be alone forever. Soon, Noriko will sit here with me. We'll be together, together in the darkness. I'll make her see my worth. I'll make her love me the way that I love her. I'll make her fill the hole, uh, I'll fill the void that Shizuko left in my life. I'll make her treat the gnawing pain in my insides. I'll make her save me from falling into despair, from falling into old habits. Noriko will save me from myself, just like Shizuko once did. I take a sip of my coffee. It's still a little hot and it skulls the gap in my mouth where my tooth once was. It hurts, but I'll be okay. Soon. It's hard to hide a smile when plans unfold perfectly. The body was here, waiting for me when I arrived at the morgue. Staring down at the pallid corpse of Junpei Matsumoto fills me with more satisfaction than I thought possible. The dog is dead, and my early morning encounter with his executioner wasn't just some feath of a dream born from wishful thinking. His body is riddled with stab wounds, deep, clean, piercing cuts. But these injuries were not inflicted by a knife. I'm no forensic pathologist, but the wounds are too thin and too deep. Each intrusion is about a width of a chopstick. That he was killed by chopsticks, though you can never rule out everything. My gaze pans down his body, looking for anything of interest. The rest of his form looks ordinary, nothing to note. I'll, unzi I'll, I'll zip up the bag for now and return him to his allocated cold chamber. Might take him out once in a while to have a laugh. As I raise the zipper covering his legs and groin, I have to shift his arms to fit them within the HRP. And then I flinch, and my hands instinctively retract from the cadaver. I'm used to the ice-cold touch of a body fresh from its containment chamber. The sensation of lifeless, preserved flesh. Thus, it wasn't the sensation of touch that caused me to startle. It was the sight of something out of the ordinary, something I'd somehow missed during my initial observation. Junpei's fingers. Five thick, meaty, meaty digits on each hand. Ten perfectly intact, dead but otherwise healthy fingers. It was only days ago that I pierced two of his fingers, his thumb and his pointer finger, using cheap metal cutlery. I can't forget the distinct feeling of plunging those implements through flesh and bone, pinning his fingers to a table. The corpse before me shows no evidence of ever being injured in such a manner. Nobody can heal wounds like that without medical attention. Even then, stitches and scars will remain. But Junpei Matsumoto's digits are 100% intact and puncture-free. Interesting. So they replaced the body. They, they fooled them. Come to think of it, didn't I snap another few of his fingers in half of the time I... In half the, that time... I confronted him outside his apartment. I'm sure I did. Crushed the bones within my own fist. But this corpse's hands don't show signs of that either. Normal to the touch. No visible bruising. Mm. On a whim, I pull out my phone and open noise. I navigate to Junpei Matsumoto's profile. Load a few profile images, swipe through them one by one. I put my phone right next to Junpei's head, comparing the similarities between Junpei's photos and his dead body. <sighs> Everything becomes clear immediately. Certain elements of Junpei's features don't match. His nose is broader in photos, his lips are thinner, more taut. The corpse in front of me is not Junpei Matsumoto. It's a copy. A clone. Junpei Matsumoto's death was faked for our entertainment. The body lying on the ground in front of the Herald was planted there before we arrived, planted to convince us that Junpei had met his maker. The Herald did not kill Junpei. The Herald simply used one of the corpse, one of Corpse Girl's tricks and produced a carbon copy body, all in order to fool myself and Noriko. As this revelation settles in my mind, I come to another conclusion. The morgue being robbed was no coincidence. I can almost guarantee that the cadaver used to replicate Junpei's death was stolen from this very place. A weapon of deception stolen and turned against us. And the morgue was targeted before Noriko even requested Junpei's death. Almost as if the human removal service predicted Noriko's movements in advance. Is that even possible? All I know for sure is that the dog is still out there, still skulking around working for his master. This is starting to get interesting. Okay, so nothing has been revealed yet. <laughs> okay, I think I'm up to date. I guess it was a good thing you decided to prod and poke Junpei's corpse, as you put it. Guess so. I thought you were just being your usual morbid self, taking corpses for your own use, whatever that may be. Don't know what to tell you. Well, I'm glad.
glad you acted, faking Junpei's death. What's their end goal? What did they really accomplish by pulling such a stunt? There's a million possible answers to that question. Can't know the real truth, not yet. The obvious answer would be that they wanted to deceive us, make us think we have the upper hand. I came to the same conclusion. They think they've fooled us, but we know better. Can we use that to our advantage? Don't know. Sometimes you're helpful, and other times you're just... What? Never mind. Okay. It irritates her when I withhold my thoughts. Sometimes I act like this just to elicit a, re a reaction from her. She's cute when she's pissed off. I don't know what we should do next. We're kind of at a dead end, right? Kind of. Corpse Girl's website has gone silent. No one is requesting deaths anymore. But... If I'm to believe the news, there are still dozens of people being killed all around the city. Which means... The human removal service is still as active as ever. Don't beat yourself up. Don't have any cadavers at the morgue anyway. Can't exactly fulfill any requests. True. She sighs and rubs her eyes. Despite her tired, exhausted appearance, she's dealing with recent events rather well. For Nordico, at any rate. Can you let me know when the morgue starts filling up again? Sure. Hang on. There is one body there. Fake Junpei. <laughs> yeah. Not much use, though, I suppose. No, not really. Keep me updated. Okay. She rubs her eyes again and tries to hold back a yawn. You look wrecked. Sorry. Things are tough right now. It'll get better. You'll cause some death soon enough. My words have the strange effect of actually cheering her up slightly. I know we're not exactly the most normal people. The things we do, the causes we devote ourselves to, they are wrong. There's no other way to put it. I know this. I trust that Nodiko knows this as well. We're morbid, sick, disgusting. Nodiko slaughters innocent people in the name of Corpse Girl, a fabricated idol or alter ego or whatever else she could be. As for me, I've got as much blood on my hands as Nodiko does. She likes to believe she's innocent, but the truth is that she's just as guilty as any killer. I don't see myself the same way. I know for a fact the things I've done are enough to put me behind bars for the rest of my life. I don't try to convince myself that I'm something I'm not. I'm a criminal, plain and simple. But Noriko is a kindred spirit. We're connected on some level that I don't expect the average person to understand. We're bonded by the things we've done, the death we've witnessed. Looking at her now, this tired girl worn thin by stress, I can't help but be reminded of Shizuko. I messed up with Shizuko. I didn't take the time we had together seriously. I took it all for granted. I won't make the same mistake with Noriko. I'll make her mine, and I'll prove my love for her every day. Perhaps that will convince her not to discard me when I've run out of use. Want something to eat? She glances at me and opens her mouth, but weighs her words before speaking. Thanks, but you know me. I know. Of course I know. I know so much about her. She doesn't eat, not unless she absolutely has to in order to live for another day. Something light? A salad? I want to share a meal with you. I... I can't. Okay. I understand. I do. I get it. It's Nodiko. Her convictions are what I admire most about her. What would it say of her character if I could break her convictions with a simple invitation? We should get married. Huh? A few days ago, you said you'd be Yeah, mine. but you didn't actually fulfill the whole promise, uh, so... I told you something like that, yeah. But that had a condition. You had to kill Junpei. Hmm. She's right. I didn't manage to kill him. Does that mean I don't deserve her? Maybe there's something else I could do? Let me prove that I'm a man you can love. I'll think about it. Okay. I'll take that. It's better than an outright no. <sighs> Maybe you should get going for now. I need to sleep. Okay. I'll leave her be. I should get some sleep myself. Later. Bye, Kojiro. Something about the way she says my name sends a chill, a chill down my spine. It's not a pleasant sensation. It's not a feeling of elation or excitement. It's uncomfortable. Disconcerting. I shrug it off and leave the factory. I have an uncannily vivid recollec recollection of dragging Shizuko's corpse through the streets on the night she was killed. I had witnessed the collision. I watched, speechless as the asshole who ran her down drove away like a coward. It took me a while to gather the strength to collect her crumpled body from the asphalt. By then, it was around 7 o'clock. The sun had set, but a sliver of light still peeked over the horizon, tinting the sky with an orange hue. People kept screaming at me. I wasn't doing anything wrong, I wasn't trying to smear Shizuko's blood on the sidewalk. I just wanted to take her home. She was hurt or dead. No point in leaving her in the middle of the road. 
She didn't comment on my suit, got all dressed up just for her. She didn't comment on the ring, even as I slipped it on her stiff finger. She didn't say a word about the size of the diamond. But she made a unique sound as we walked. It rings in my ears now and then, especially when I catch myself in quiet moments. I didn't know what it was at the time. It punctured the silence between my heavy footsteps. Turns out the sound was caused by the fabric of her dress stretching and ripping across the coarse texture of the sidewalk. She made that sound for the entire journey home. My footsteps thud thud. She's a court. Sure, sure. People screaming. Ah, kya. The cacophony of irritating noise assaulted us during the entire expedition. Silence didn't rear its head until we arrived at our destination. It wasn't easy getting her up the stairs to my apartment. I'd carried her in my arms dozens of times, always effortlessly, but during the final ascent, Shizuko's weight exceeded the limit of my muscles. I had no choice but to drag her up slowly, a single step at a time. It wasn't my fault her head cracked against every step. Once we were inside, I finally had the opportunity to examine the damage. Her limbs were flattened, her chest had caved in, ribs crushed and ground into a fine dust. Remarkably, her beautiful face remained unmarred. She looked at peace despite having died in pure agony not long before. And that was the last time I kissed her. I planted my lips on hers and found comfort in the slight warmth that still remained. And then I closed her eyes. Yes, we didn't kill her. It's good to know at least. My memory of that event is so clear that thinking about it feels like I'm reliving it again for the first time. The pain hasn't dulled, but I'm glad I don't live in that apartment anymore. Climbing those steps every day would only serve to remind me of dragging Shizuko behind me. I cut myself free from the chains that shackled me to her, but I can never destroy the memories. I think they'll haunt me to the rest of my, to the end of my days. Perhaps that's why I'm so desperate to fill the void she left in my life. I'm desperate to distract myself with the love from another. And yet, at that time, I didn't want to let her go. I wanted to hold her cold, lifeless corpse to my body and simply waste away so I could join her in the afterlife. In fact, I was so attached to her corpse, I did something I'd never done before. Not once in all my history of toying with dead bodies. I decided to keep her, I knew it. I knew it. Hold it already. Don't know whether it was out of despair or depression or desperation. Don't truly know why I decided to do such an odd thing. Possessed by a single disturbing idea, I emptied out the small storage closet in that old ap ap apartment, discarded everything within, and then I carefully, delicately, lovingly placed Shizuko inside the dark space. She stood up against the wall, almost casually, almost like she was alive. I held her in place with some rope fastened to the wall, a loop around her neck and a few bindings around her waist. She sagged a little, but it wasn't overly noticeable. There, Shizuko stood before me. Though her gaze was lowered, I could almost fool myself into thinking she wanted to greet me. Or she wanted to simply say goodbye. Goodbye. Something I'd never considered saying to her. But I knew it was time. Time to say goodbye to her, and to say goodbye to myself. The me that shared a life with her. The me that lived in shame of the things I'd done. Into that small storage room I piled the evidence of my guilt. All the macabre and sickening paraphernalia I had collected over the years found a new home within that dark space. Photos of corpses, tomes written about embalming and mummification, countless books by Nobel Sinclair, that author I held so dearly to my heart. Everything and everyone that made up Kojiro found itself inside that room. Are you Nobel Sinclair? I'm suddenly curious. He's, no, he's, he's never written anything in his damn life. Al although, no, because if he's, I was going to say, if he's, he's now doing kind of what Nobel Sinclair wrote about, right? He, like, posed dead bodies in a way, right? But that was, he's not, he already re reads him, so it's not that. And with one last look at the girl, I slammed the door and locked it tight. The ceremonial act of locking away everything I once loved had a cathartic effect, but the, but the moments after that aren't as clear in my mind. I know that I sealed up the room and concealed the door, but I don't recall the effort that went into doing so. I know that I decided to leave the apartment behind, but I don't recall talking to the landlord. I know that I tried to move on from being the person I once was, but I don't know how much I truly changed. Okay, so the whatever's in his closet right now isn't physical. Okay. Because just over a year later, I'm still in this world, taking part in truly disturbing acts. I'm still obsessed with the dead, and I'm still fawning over Shizu Noriko. Maybe people can't change after all. Maybe I've been fooling myself all this time into thinking that I'm different now, but I'm not. I'm the same as I always was. I'm still just Kojiro. Maybe that's okay.
Some good news for you. Really? What is it? A few new cadavers were in the morgue when I arrived tonight. Ah! Uh. Also, I was thinking... What about? Something funny. We went to such lengths to make sure we didn't get caught stealing cadavers from here. And? Well, it's amusing that the entire place was ransacked by the Human Removal Service, but no one ever investigated. No one here seemed to really care. We tried so hard to cover our tracks, being careful about every single corpse we lifted. Then those assholes just waltzed in and stole everything without any repercussions. Yeah. It makes me sick. I want to bring them down. Yeah. Anyway, how many bodies came in today? Four. Not a great deal, but a start. Give it a week or two, and this place should be packed once more. Okay. Good. Thanks for letting me know. Of course. See you. Later. Since I've already catalogued the new arrivals, I figure I can relax for the rest of my shift. I plant myself on the uncomfortable steel chair parked near the morgue's entryway. A few moments later, I'm lost within the flashing lights from my phone screen. Don't know how long I zoned out for, but when I come to, Nodiko's name is emblazoned across my screen. Strange for her to call me now, since we spoke just before. Yo. You're not going to believe this. Try me. Somebody requested a death! Ah, oh, that explains the excitement in her voice. Congrats. It's been a while. It's been far too long. I thought we were done for. I thought Corpse Girl's website had fallen into obscurity. Happy for you. Kojiro, we can't let this slip through our fingers. We need a victory here. This new request has to be fulfilled immediately. Hmm. I want this victim to die with a bang. I want his death to propel Corpse Girl's name back into the limelight. Roger. Awaiting your orders. I'm sending you the Vic's photo. Get me a corpse that matches his appearance, just like usual. Only got a handful of bodies here, remember? Going to be a long shot. Do whatever the fuck you have to do. The icy cold commands leaves no room to be misinterpreted. The call ends and I immediately receive a message from Noriko. Opening it up reveals the photo of Corpse Girl's latest victim. Male, mid-thirties or so, fairly unremarkable guy. Let's see what bodies are in stock. I heave myself off the steel chair and log into the morgue's computer. Scanning through the inventory only takes a few seconds. There are five cadavers here in total. The four that arrived today, plus Junpei Matsumoto, look the Ma Junpei Matsumoto look alike. Looking through the details reveals that of the five, three are female and two are male. I immediately rule out using the Junpei lookalike corpse for this request. It's a heavy set body and doesn't match the victim at all. I'll need to take a look at the other male, but I don't like the odds of finding a match. I navigate to the cold chambers and open up the cache housing the, the corpse in question. The cold air spewing forth from the open compartment fogs up my glasses. I calmly remove them, wipe them against my coat, and return them to their rightful place. After unzipping the body bag, I am met with the face of death, a sight I have become more than accustomed to after many long years working here. This guy is just as average looking as Corpse Girl's victim. Seems like the type of person you wouldn't notice in a crowd. He'd simply be a blur against the sea of bodies. Might be exactly what we need. I compare his fe features to those of the victim in the photo. He looks similar, couldn't exactly mistake him for a relative, but maybe with a bit of Noriko's makeup handiwork, he might pass off as close enough as a close enough copy. Oh. Only one problem. Unzipping the body bag further reveals that this guy only has one arm. His left arm has been severed just below the elbow, leaving a surgical stump. It's something that he has clearly lived with for years because the area in question is clean. Probably had a prosthetic limb before being moved to the morgue. This particular feature is a deal breaker. Too hard to convince the victim that his too hard to convince the victim that this is his own corpse if it's missing a limb. Although, perhaps Noriko could factor the missing limb into the cause of death. If I bloodied the stump a bit, it could be made to look like he lost an arm before he died. I reach for my phone and call Noriko back, getting sick of the chit chat. You find a suitable corpse? Almost. Got a guy about the same age and build. Plain face. Need some work, but could do the job. Great! I'll send Tomoe over with the van right away. Just one thing. What? The body is missing an arm. Oh, that is a problem. Yeah. Can you edit the corpse photo so that the victim is missing an arm? Make it look like it got chopped off before he died. That way, when he receives the actual corpse, he'll be expecting a missing limb. No. No? I'm already in the middle of making the photo. I'm not changing it now. Then I don't know what to tell you. Don't have any other suitable bodies. Make it work, Kojiro. The, that venomous tone again. What can I do? Not going to roam the street and kill someone that looks like the Vic. Come up with something else then. Hell, chop your own arm off and attach it to the corpse. I don't care what you do. Don't say that to him, he'll probably fucking do it. But I need the body within the hour. If 
you let me down, I'll never be with you. Our relationship is tied to Corpse Girl's fate. I mean, clearly Noriko is, like, a really manipulative person. Let's not, like, like, get it twisted. If you let her down, you'll let me down. And I don't like being let down. My phone beeps twice as if to protest Noriko abruptly ending the call. Fantastic. Why like, can't you just attach some one of the other body's arms onto his? She likes backing me into corners. What am I supposed to do? It's clear that she doesn't really have any intention of being with me. She's using me, dangling the promise of something I desire right in front of me. And yet, I need to have her. I need to prove to her that she should be with me. I lower my glasses and gently rub my brow with my fingers. Shit. I've got an idea. But I can't believe I'm about to do this. I slide my glasses back up and adjust them so they're comfortable once more. I fetch the mobile mortuary lift and angle it underneath the tray protruding from the open cold chamber. With a great deal of effort, I detach the tray from the chamber. It rests upon the top of the mortuary lift, allowing me to wheel the corpse across the morgue. After pushing it halfway across the open room, I let the wheels come to a stop directly underneath one of the ceiling's glaring fluorescent lights. With that done, I turn and rummage around in a cabinet. I sort through a number of tools until I find what I'm looking for. Clutching the sterile implement in a shaking hand, I return to the corpse lying atop the steel tray. I roll up the sleeves of my Where coat. Go? Oh my god, he's actually going to do it? I mean, maybe the Junpei lookalike's arm is too big. I don't know. I still feel like you could make it work. Here it goes. Or just use one of the girls. Who cares? That is not tight at all. This is just- I'm sorry, but this is just stupid. I can suspend my disbelief for the police, I suppose, even though that's like the most glaring thing to me right now, is that the police just aren't doing anything about it, even though they're allegedly like doing stuff about it. I don't know. But this is just like stupid. When the metal bone saw digs into the soft flesh on, of my arm, I have to grip my teeth to refrain from screaming. I angle the blade so it cuts away from my elbow, knee to leave that intact. The cutting process is pure agony. To prevent myself from passing out, I keep my breathing steady and try to focus on something simple. Something my brain can handle while aflame with pain. I begin to count. One, two, three. I count the seconds that it takes for the jagged metal saw to reach bone. Fifteen, sixteen. Still just flesh and muscle and blood spurting down my coat. Twenty, twenty-one. I think I reach sinew after twenty-four seconds, but it's hard to tell because there's a terrible numbness that is somehow worse than the original searing agony. My fingers clutching the saw begin to slip due to perspiration. It's getting harder to even hold the tool. After some 32 odd seconds, the saw hits bone. I slide it back and forth, cutting into the dense matter with as much strength as my failing body can muster. Vomit and drool have soaked the front of my coat and begun to smear together with the blood. It's forming a shallow pool at my feet and the stench of mixing liquids threatens to overwhelm my senses. Counting the seconds has become infinitely more difficult. 43, 44, 4, 30... Was it 21 seconds so far? No, it's been longer than that. It has to have been a minute by now. I've been sawing into my own arm for a full minute, but the blade still hasn't cut through all the bone. I don't recall when I fell to my knees. Don't recall when I stood back up. Don't recall running the slimy fingers through my hair or when flecks of blood splattered against my glasses or when my bladder relieved itself. Don't even recall why I'm doing this. Is it for Shizuko? Is it because I love her? No, Noriko. It's for Noriko. Actually, it's for Corpse Girl. I have to prove I'm worthy of her. I have to be loved by her. There's nothing else for me. 97, 98. As my count reaches 99 seconds, my right arm falls to the wet tile floor, flopping like a dead fish against the deck of a boat. I let out a groan of what can only be called relief, and I slump in on myself, resting in the pool of foul liquid. My vision is blurry. My breathing is ragged. The same part of my consciousness knows that I need to treat my wound. I need to apply a tourniquet or cauterize the damage, or I'm just going to bleed out and die on the floor of my own morgue. But a quiet voice in my mind, the very same one that drove me to such an extreme measure, urges me to finish my work. Getting to my feet is a struggle. I try to push myself up off the ground using both arms, but of course, I fall flat on my face when my right arm fails to re react to my mental instructions. I think the lenses of my glasses smashed against the tiles because my eyes seem to be bleeding now. A second attempt at pushing off the ground is more successful. My left arm is somehow strong enough to hoist my barely responsive body. I sway and stagger around aimlessly before collecting myself enough to attempt to fish my severed arm off the ground. Luckily, I managed to grasp the blood and vomit soaked wrist of my former limb with one of my good ha with my one good hand. I drag myself towards the mortuary lift that holds aloft the corpse I need to attach my arm to. 
but I didn't think this through. I don't really know how to attach a severed limb. I bludgeon the corpse's stump with my useless arm, trying to find some point of connection that will magically fuse the limb to the corpse. It's hopeless, and as I madly flail the arm around, I can't help but laugh at the whole situation. Of course I can't attach my arm to this corpse. The corpse is missing its left arm. I cut off my right arm. <laughs> You're dumb as fuck, dude. Good one. I throw my useless detached arm behind me and rest my weary body against the mortuary lift. Accompanying my laughter is the laughter of somebody else nearby. I have to listen really intently to confirm that I'm not just hallucinating, but I'm certain that somebody just walked into my line of vision, even if they are nothing more than a dark, blurred silhouette. Oh, no, bro. You don't look so hot. Jinpei. What did you do? Cut off your own arm? I know the voice, but I can't place it right now. It's not my voice, and it's not Noriko's voice. Want me to take the pain away? Yes, please. I'd give anything to remove the pain. I can't voice my consent. My mouth is dry, my jaw locked in yeah. place. Nothing a little fire can't fix. The figure comes closer. He smells foul, like a dog that is bathed in gasoline. A dog. The heavyset figure that I now assume is Junpei Matsumoto is crouched over me. The smell of gasoline intensifies as he pours some sort of cold liquid all over my clothes. Pity I gotta light this place up. But you guys didn't get the hint when we stole all of your corpses. Well, you ain't gonna be nothing without your precious more. And Corpse Girl is gonna wither away without her right hand man <laughs> right hand get it go jimbo but he deliberately mispronounces my name really bothers me it bothers me so much that the anger boiling inside me gives me the strength to open my mouth once more it's kojiro sure bro sleep tight the dog lifts his body and disappears into oblivion beyond my sight the unmistakable sound of a match being struck should fill me with panic but i feel strangely calm warm glowing tendrils of flame flicker around the outskirts of my vision Fire. The entire morgue is alight. The acrid smell of smoke quickly covers up the odor of gasoline. Fire. I lost my family to fire so many years ago. Maybe it's fitting that I should perish in the same way. Fire. I hate fire. I hate it and fear it. Fire. It's everywhere, surrounding me. The sickening stench of burning flesh permeates my nostrils, and I realize it's the smell of my severed arm being incinerated behind me. Fire. I close my eyes. Really sleepy right now. Lost a lot of blood after all. Sorry, Noriko. Sorry I loved you. Is he dead now? I completed Act 2. Okay. What is Act 3? Going back to Noriko? Aoi. Okay. Interesting. Another month later. Okay. after my birthday okay um i'll see you in the next one i'm gonna do one more i think